Let's take a little trip into Acts chapter 2. And Peter uses the same scripture as does Paul over in Romans 10. Uh, now, it's been said that this whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved has to do with the Jews praying and were to simply believe and everything's all different and this is the great era of hyper-dispensationalism. Um, it is actually anti-Semitic because it has the Jews having to do some requirements to punish them for um, crucifying the Messiah. But let me tell you this, all of us nailed Jesus to the tree. Every last one of us that's ever lived. Um, but somehow the Jews all get corroded in there together um, and it's all their fault exclusively and nobody else's fault. Well, um, everyone in Adam has sinned and Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. And that's what Paul wrote. And um, this calling upon the name of the Lord has been grossly misrepresented. It has caused much evil as of late. Now, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost has come. Um, and it's on the day of Pentecost, the fourth of seven feasts for the nation of Israel. Chapter 2, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. You notice proselytes, that is uh, Gentiles that's converted uh, to Judaism. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Notice it's God's works. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto to you and hearken to my words for these are not drunken as ye suppose seeing it is but the third hour of the day but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and he's going to use the same scripture that Paul does Romans chapter 10 the last part it, he is and it shall come to pass in the last day saith God I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will shew wonders in heaven above and in signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. Paul, uh, Peter here was also talking to proselytes, not just the Jews. Peter takes the scripture, which is clearly a scripture that is going to apply later on at the second coming without a doubt. 
and he uses it for this day, for the beginning of a new dispensation. Uh, the birth of the church, where believers are indwelt and sealed by the Holy Spirit. And he says, verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if calling means prayer, and Jews are supposed to do this, um, he doesn't tell them to get right to it. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. There's the blood right there in Acts chapter 2, okay? Um, Peter's giving them the gospel. He's telling them um, Jesus Christ died on the cross, and whom God hath raised up. See, there he is. He's been raised up from the dead. So you have the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Paul, uh, Peter is testifying of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified. See, there's the blood in Acts chapter 2. Both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I've already explained in a previous video called the Baptism of Acts 2.38 that the baptism here is not a water baptism. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit because water baptism is not going to give you a remission of sins. It is not going to do it for the Jew any more than it is for a Gentile because uh, both Paul and Peter have taught that there is no difference. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. All of us need a Savior. All of us need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust in Him fully for salvation, whether Jew or Gentile. And uh, people go, all hyper D, and they say, well, that was before Acts chapter 15. No, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that is the putridness, that is the wickedness, that is the vileness of this evil hyper-dispensationalist nonsense. And I rebuke it most strongly. It is wicked. These Jews here are saved the same way we are saved. They are saved by faith alone. Everyone who's ever lived has been saved by faith alone. Um, no amount of sacrificing or any works on anybody's part is going to save them. Now, 
Once again, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Who's afar off? The Gentiles. The Gentiles are afar off. The promise is to us too. Exactly what Peter's saying here is for us too. And that is the haughtiness and the arrogance of trying to be a hyper-dispensationalist and, and um, saying, I rightly divide the word of truth because I take this verse here and then I twist the meaning to have it say something else. And that is wickedness. Absolute wickedness. It has done nothing but cause grief and confusion, especially among new believers. And I rebuke it most strongly. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Ah, of that word call. As many as our Lord our God shall save. See, it is salvation. This calling is the salvation of a person. How is that accomplished? By believing. Now, hmm, that's really strange because, and listen to this. Verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. See, the very next verse, he links up with as many as our Lord shall call and tells them, Save yourselves. How do we save ourselves? The only thing we can do is trust in Jesus Christ alone. There is no other way to save ourselves. But Peter says, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. He's saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to go to hell with the rest of the world. Okay? He's saying, uh, put your faith in Jesus. Now, the hyper D would have you believe because they've rewritten the Bible. Then said Peter unto them, therefore, because thou art Jews, therefore I commandeth thee to pray uh, all these prayers when you call upon the name of the Lord, uh, because that is a requirement for you Jews. Because you Jews are born again, whereas Gentiles are not born again, so you have some extra requirements that need to be accomplished. Hmm. Well, see, that's what hyperdispensationalism does. It adds to the Word of God. It distorts, it twists the Word of God. It takes away from the Word of God. There is no rightly dividing with this kind of false, wicked doctrine. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Flee from these wicked teachers that teach this perverseness. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. See, now we have a water baptism. The first baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now uh, people received his word. They were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So that's, that's a pretty good day there for uh, salvation. 3,000 people in one day. And they continued steadfastly. Now notice after all this, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Ah, now comes the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed, ah, there's that word believed, were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So, there you go. Peter uses the same scripture. Never once does he tell them all that they have to pray in order to be saved. I've been grossly misrepresented over and over by a foolish heretic that does not know his Bible. So, that is going to do it for this video. God bless and take care.